worldwide to a very special Saturday night program broadcast of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Today is, this is a live broadcast, today is the 27th day of October 2012. I'm Doug Hagman, I'm the senior host along with my son and my co-host Joe Hagman. Folks, you're about to hear three hours of very special programming with our guest tonight. Uh, and we're very honored, folks, to, to have two fine gentlemen with us tonight. Steve Quayle, a world re- internationally renowned author. And uh, he's, of course, uh, can be found at stevequayle.com. And, of course, Dr. Paul Hegstrom. He's our very special guest. Um, now, folks, if you have not heard about Dr. Paul Hegstrom, he is internationally renowned author of two books, Broken Children and Grown Up Pain, or Broken Children, Grown Up Pain, and Angry Men and the woman, Women Who Love Them. Uh, beyond the dust jacket of his books, Dr. Hegstrom is something even more. Uh, he's a genuine exhibit of real life post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, as a matter of fact, his life story, his own experiences, and that of his wife, uh, were the subject of a CBS movie starring the late John Ritter. Uh, 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 playing uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Hegstrom, and uh, Harley Jane Kozak as Judy Hegstrom. Now, it's the story of Paul and Judy's life experience with uh, domestic violence and, of course, Paul's recovery. And Dr. Hegstrom is really an, an expert, a real-life story of PTSD. And we're very, very happy to have both of them. And by the way, uh, Dr. Hegstrom's website is Life Skills International. You just have to go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, or you can go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, click on the link there to LifeSkillsintl.org. Joe, welcome to tonight's program. Very excited for tonight. Uh, I think both of our guests are here. We're going to go to Dr. Paul Hegstrom, see if he is on the line with us. Uh, Mr. Hegstrom, are you there? I am here. How are you doing? Excellent. So glad you can join us tonight. Now let's see if we can get Steve Quayle on the line. And Steve, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and I think tonight's going to be a very special night. You know, Broken Children, Grown Up Pain was a book that I ordered and got before uh, – I had a chance to spend a week with Dr. Hagstrom and angry men and the women who love them. One of the cries across the country is, where are the men of God? And God has given to Dr. Hagstrom a remarkable understanding. And I'm not talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about revelation on how the human brain works, especially with arrested development, meaning that the trauma in early life, especially before the age of 13, gives us filters in which we see everything uh, and, and through a discussion distorted lens. And tonight I've asked Dr. Hagstrom to talk about spirituality and, and sexuality. We're going to talk about the difference between guilt and shame. But uh, I told Dr. Hagstrom, and I think I told you, Doug, this on the phone, and Joe, you may have heard this, but all of the requests that I've been getting are from genuine people that want to walk in the power of God and the freedom of God. And the women who send me emails are always complaining most of the time about their husbands. Not all of them, but the majority. So I asked Dr. Hagstrom tonight if he would be so kind to address those issues of guilt and shame and also the whole issue of why men are so uh, under constant attack to basically uh, take their hearts away from God and basically keep them. The devil keeps men in a perpetual guilt of shame, and it's like the lust of the eyes, and and I I want to explain lust from my standpoint. The lust of the eyes is something I believe is supernatural, and God wants to give men tonight across the country, and women, freedom. So I will uh, go quiet, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Hagstrom, because he said to me the other day on the uh, phone, and I was watching one of his DVDs, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to encourage you, this is not a pitch for a book. This is a pitch for a change of life. But when I read Broken Children, Growing Up Pain, I was absolutely astonished that every single sentence seemed to fit. And there are a lot of people carrying a lot of uh, issues in their childhood, whether it's uh, uh, any type of literal trauma, sexual trauma, uh, uh, stress, being abandoned. There are so many issues, and I believe that tonight God is truly going to move supernaturally and set people free. So LifeSkillsInternational.org, and with no further uh, me taking away from the important time, uh, Dr. Hagstrom, where would you like to begin tonight? Because, again, the issues I think that, 
the men are asking me to ask you and have been since the last time we've come on how do we get out of our shame mode how do we you know how do we get free of pornography how do we get free of the stuff that seems to track us and these are godly men by the way somebody says oh that can't happen to a godly man if the honest ones will admit it the dishonest ones will hide from it and i know this from the dealing of the lord in the life of my life and the lives of others you can't hide from them so you might as well confess it right away and get it cleaned and get it uh fixed up no matter what your trauma is, no matter what your filters are, God has an answer. So go ahead, sir. Well, and what's interesting, too, is uh, folks on the family did a lot of research, and they had a pastoral hotline. And and this was for just just pastors, basically. And 80% of the response, H.B. London spoke at our church uh, some time ago, and he said 80% of the response of the, of the pastor's hotline was pastors who were addicted to pornography and how do we get set free of that? And so that's one of the things I was I was into pornography horribly um, when I was uh, you know when I was at my wackiness and I hated it but I I couldn't quit it and then as we wrote the program the the curriculum for Life Skills International uh, started writing 30 years ago God gave me the answers to a lot of questions. And and uh, it it broke me away from the need of pornography, but here's the here's where I sit today. I was able through the way God taught me to to work through this. I was able to literally rewire the brain until now, 30 years later, and this really happened about three four years into my recovery, that I I lost because I rewired the brain, I lost the ability to recall the pictures. I know that I lived in that sin, but I could recall the pictures for fantasy and that kind of thing. But about three, four years into my recovery, my brain literally rewired till I am not able today to recall any of the pictures that uh, I looked at when I was deep into pornography. So the brain can rewire, and God can eliminate those things out of our brain. It is a process, but there's reasons that our brain caters to that type of situation. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to start out and explain again the, what arrested development really is, and then we'll build on that till we, and, and we'll build right through uh, guilt and shame and why we do the things we do, and, uh, and and get into what PTSD really is and why we're stuck in those areas and how to get free of them. So I think we've got a, a pretty good three hours that we can we can really uh, put it in order and help people be free of, those, of, that, of that habit, be free of shame, grow up, make decisions, and uh, and do the things we need to do in a marriage relationship such as emotional bonding, and those kind of things that takes the place of uh, self gratification and uh, and the fantasies that uh, that we use as children to uh, to self gratify. So uh, it's going to be quite an evening if we can stay on track. Well, let's let, and indeed let's try to do that. And, and Dr. Hegstrom, uh, and I've got to tell the, the listeners uh, there are people all over the world that, that come to you for assistance for help. You give uh, lectures all over the world as well, so we're very fortunate. Dr. Hegstrom, um, wh- where do we start here? I mean, obviously in this country as well as throughout the world, we've, we've got problems. But but where do we start? Yeah. W- w- I, I mean, go ahead and just. Uh, Start us out, because I don't even know where to start, because the problem is so huge here. It is huge. And, and where we start is, is many years ago, uh, our, our God's enemy really decided that, that in looking at how God put the family and the growth pattern together in the Torah, the, the Jewish culture does something that's very wonderful. In the first 13 years or 12 years of life, that's called the age of directives. And the scripture says, train up a child the way he should go. When he gets old, he won't depart from it. But that's kind of a mistranslation. I, if you go directly from the, the uh, train up a child the way he should go, and when he gets old, he won't depart from it. But the real Hebrew 
if you translate it directly into English, not coming through a Septuagint or other translations, it will say, train a child in his bent. And the Old Testament is written to male, uh, and, and the females, you know, that's included, but it's written to the male. That was the culture of the time. And so what what was required then is a child, a male child, if if in the first 12 years of his life you can figure out what, as a parent, uh, what his talents are, what his bent is, what his interests are, and those kind of things. And then you, you cater to that. Each child is an individual. And you train the child in the things that interest the child. And when it's trained in the in the synagogue or the temple or in the Jewish culture, then then the child it says when the child if you if you train a child in his bent, when he grows whiskers he will have a foundation in which to build his life. So it isn't an old man thing. It's a situation where if you train the child in the ways of of, of God, then when he comes into adolescence, that's when he grows whiskers. So when he comes into adolescence and goes through the bar mitzvah, he will move from the age of directives. So from birth to 13 years of age is the age of directives. Then when he moves into the bar mitzvah, he has a foundation when he grows the whiskers or when he comes into adolescence. He has a foundation on which to build his life. And that's what that verse of scripture in Proverbs really talks about is that he'll have that foundation. And then for the rest of his life, he will be successful. And that's why the Jewish culture is very successful, because they use the wisdom of the Torah to train the children. So the child below the age of puberty is a child that is is a child in need of directives. Then at the bar mitzvah, they have a celebration that the child has now reached the age of decision. So you have two ages, uh, the age of directives and the age of decision. So the enemy of God then tries to hurt the child through traumatic uh, systems somewhere or another, such as rejection, heavy rejection in the original family, incest, sexual abuse, uh, uh of emotional abuse and physical abuse and what happens is that abuse actually freezes the brain because the child in the age of directives is missing three chemicals and the chemicals are serotonin dopamine and norepinephrine now i had somebody challenge me on that and i'm going to i'm going to hold to my research because it's accurate if you were to do an autopsy or a spinal tap, you would find traces of those chemicals in a spinal tap. But the the chemicals in the pre-puberty child are very, very low. But when the child goes to puberty, then that's the time the chemicals turn on, and the three chemicals, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, are the chemicals that cause the child to be able to reason and if the child has been wounded below the age of the chemicals kicking in, it activates, the, the trauma activates the adrenaline glands and the, and the cortisol in the child, and the child goes on an adrenaline fix and stays on that adrenaline fix because of the wounds that are unresolved and will stay on that adrenaline fix for the rest of its life. The adrenaline is the strongest chemical in the body. It is the chemical that gives us the fight flight syndrome. It's the chemical that kicks out when we live in fear and, and we're not in a safe place. And so God's enemy knows that if they can if, if he can wound the child into a uh, in the age below the bar mitzvah when the chemicals kick in, the child will then be on adrenaline for the rest of its life and will not be able to go on to maturity. It will be a child that needs directives until they die. And so it's called fixation in mental health. Uh, We call it arrested emotional development, AED. And in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that's the foundation of and the source of PTSD. 
and they have never found how to restart the chemical structure in the brain and to get somebody off of adrenaline. So the adrenaline that they live with as they get into the teen years is responsible for ADD, ADHD, borderline personality, histrionic personality, sociopathic personality, because I'm in a survival mode trying to stay uh, alive, fearing what could happen to me next, and I see the world through the lenses of a child, even though I may be 35 to 50 to 70 to 90 years of age. And that's why it's called fixation in mental health. And the dsm 4 that would be the diagnosis, would be fixation. And so what they try to do then is medicate you. And, and I'm not against medication, but they need to get you off of adrenaline by, by dealing with the core wounds in childhood and, and resolving those issues. But this information is, is not well known around the world. And so they put young kids on medication and kind of numb them down. But what Life Skills does is it helps us understand that we are not, de- we, we're not deficient. We aren't uh, dirty, damaged, and different, and flawed and defective. There's always a reason for our behavior. Let's look at a man that can't bond with a wife emotionally. He's been hurt in childhood, and he's acting like a child. And his wife will even say, I thought I married a man. I dated a man and married a little boy. On the other side of it, he may say, I thought I dated a woman and married a little girl. Because people that are have, have tendencies to deal with wounds like this will look for another person that's wounded like themselves because they think they know how to cope with it. So that gets us off to a bad start in, in marriages and relationships and and uh, those kind of things. And so what Life Skills does is we go back and instead of doing couples counseling, we go back and heal the wounds of childhood and deal with the issues that should have been dealt with before either had a first date with anybody, let alone each other. And when we get those things resolved, our parents didn't help us do that. Our parents were wounded. And it's a generational thing. Shame is a generational thing. And and our brain was never meant to deal with shame. It was meant to deal with guilt. And we'll get into that uh, later in the program. But I want to lay the foundations that if I'm wounded, before my, my three chemicals kick in, then I'm stuck because the adrenaline has kicked in to get me in a survival mode, and I stay in that survival mode for the rest of my life. And so, All right. Okay. Uh, 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 now, let me ask you this, Doctor. Uh, and I, uh, we all know, for example, in the age of directives uh, from birth to thirteen, we all know that something very traumatic, like uh, somebody being uh, uh, attacked, uh, you know, physically abused, or something like that, uh, yes. that's obvious. That, that's very obvious. But are there are there injuries? Is emotional injury. I mean, give me an example of perhaps something that might not be as obvious as a physical attack or physical abuse. That uh, we... abuse or that type of thing. Right. And then that's why rejection is worse than Ooh. than uh, all the other things because it's so subtle. We we think uh, when we're when we're rejected, we don't realize that we're being rejected. We just know that something isn't right. So let's look at the various areas of rejection. First of all. When I don't have the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine as a child and I'm wounded, I, 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 my, my brain freezes uh, and then I then become responsible for everything that hurts in my life. Here's where it gets subtle. Say, for instance, and this is not as subtle as other things, but say, for instance, that I'm five years old and my mommy died in childbirth giving birth to a baby sister or something like that. The child that has been wounded will take 100% responsibility for anything and everything that goes wrong in its life for the rest of its life, and it stays stuck or frozen or arrested in emotional development for a lifetime. So I spend the rest of my life wondering, what did I do wrong that caused mommy to die? Why did grandma die? When my my mommy and daddy get a divorce, what did I do wrong that caused my mommy and daddy to get a divorce? Let me give you an example of that. When Judy and I remarried, 
after seven years of separation and divorce. My children were 19, 23, and 24, and they all came home because I had changed so much they wanted to be around Dad, and they wanted to fulfill the Daddy stuff they never got because I was so absent from the home for the years that they were growing up. I'm working on my son's Pontiac with him, and we're just you were just talking casually, and he said, you know, Dad, I wish I'd never been born. And I said, Jeff, why would you say that? And he says, well, when when it was you and Mom and Tammy and Heidi, you stayed together, but after I was born, you got a divorce. So it must have been me. And I thought, no, that, that had nothing to do with it. The divorce was because of pre-existing junk that Judy and I had never worked out uh, at all in, in you know, any premarital counseling or anything. It was not about you and just crying by that time. And he's a 19-year-old young man. But he just he carried that load for 19 years that after he was born, we divorced. So I went to his sister, Heidi, and I said, Heidi, do you ever feel that it's because of you that mom and dad divorced? And all of a sudden, she started sobbing just uncontrollably. And she says, yeah, she says, when I was born, I was colicky, and I've heard all the stories that I came too quick and, and all of that, and and I was ugly, and, and I, I was nasty, and I demanded a lot of attention if it hadn't been for me. And she just had listed all the stuff that I, that I had said about her when she was a child because she, she was an energy sucker. But it was not her fault. It was, it, it was how I looked at it. But she absorbed responsibility. So I'd go to her older sister, Tammy, and I said, do you ever feel that it was your fault that Mom and Dad divorced? And she started crying. And all three children had taken full responsibility without talking to each other that it was their fault that, that mom and dad divorced. Now, that is, is not obvious, but look how they felt and that load they carried. And these are 19, 23, and 24-year-old children. So they wow. would have carried that for a lifetime. But it's subtle. It doesn't seem like it, it's as big as it really is to them. But because of the abuse that they went through, they 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 got on adrenaline. The adrenaline put them in a survival mode and stopped the chemicals that would cause them to reason together, to grow up, to learn to make decisions, and, and become normal children. They were locked up. And so we, Judy and I really worked together to free the children from the responsibilities of things that went wrong in our family, and we, Julie and I owned it. I owned my my abuse. I owned everything, and and we're still, uh, Julie and I have been remarried 29 years this December, but we're still working with our with our kids, and they're adults. My, my children now are, are like 46, 50, uh, 50, and 51 in November, so these are adult children, but we've walked through this, this recovery with them. We have been able to validate them. We've made sense of the craziness, and they're all they're all basically doing quite well. Uh, the healing's there, and they're all married, and their their marriages are stable, and they're serving Christ. And it's just you know I'm 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 thrilled with with the recovery within our own family, and that's why with that kind of recovery, if it works at home, let's pass it out. And so over the last thirty years of, of life skills, we have touched thousands and tens of thousands of people from around the world. They fly in from Europe, China, Peru, Argentina, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and and uh, we spend like a week, and sometimes we can spend up to three months with a family that's really fractured. So it's, it's, it's exciting to see the response that this is fixable. Well, the, that's great. And, and Dr. Hegstrom, is it fair to say uh, that Every child of a of a broken marriage has that uh, has that dysfunction or that uh, responsibility, the feeling of responsibility on them. I mean, is that pretty common? Or it's extremely common because the the trauma is in the brain. Our creator set it up so that that child has the right to its birth mommy and birth daddy. That that's in there, and that's why there's and we can talk about adopted children and and the struggle that an adopted child goes through because there's they know in their knower that they have a right to their birth mother and birth father. 
And so if if the if there's a divorce before puberty and the children are stuck in the middle of that, dad says, well, dad will always love you. Mom says, well, I'll always love you. But that's not what they want to know. The children want to know, does dad love mom and mom love dad? So our home is going to be safe. That's what the kids want to know. Wow. See? And they, okay. don't, they don't know they need to know that, but that's what they need. That's the way our creator programmed their thalamus. And the thalamus basically is the hard drive, and the hippocampus is the ram, and the amygdala is break the glass and pull the lever, something's on fire. And that sets off the adrenaline. So uh, from a biblical standpoint, uh, you know, one could say, look, uh, we're, we're wired to, uh, I mean, to to stay married. Uh, and, and, I mean, we can go in a lot of different directions here, the traditional family, and I'm sure that the non-traditional family would put stress on uh, on children of a uh, of, uh, of you know like a homosexual marriage that type of thing. I, 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 my head's spinning here. So, well, continue, doctor. I because uh, you know I, help uh, keep me on point here uh, because there's so much, so many areas we can go into. Uh, well, there really is. But but here's the point. I I work with I work with couples that they're in the second and third marriages, and and I will ask the question. I'll ask it individually not together, but I will say to the husband, if if you worked as hard on your first marriage as you are on this marriage trying to keep it together, what would have happened? He said, well, I, I, I wasn't as committed, and now that I'm in a third marriage, I'm, I'm committed to make this work. I'm tired of playing house, and I'm tired of what's going on in my life, but I can tell you if I had worked this hard on my first marriage, we'd probably still be married. I'd say the same thing, the same thing to the wife. And they can talk about it, you know, later, but she'll say the same thing. I didn't work as hard on on the first marriage or the second marriage as I'm working on this one because I'm, I am I don't want to fail again. And so the things that we have to realize is 90% of the issues that all marriages deal with or all cohabitating relationships deal with, 98% of the issues are rooted below the age of seven to nine and should have been dealt with before either one had a first date with anybody, let alone each other. But we don't, nobody tells us that. And so we don't work out those pre-existing issues. There's no sense in doing couples counseling. There's no sense in doing a celebration weekend uh, on a marriage enrichment situation when you haven't dealt with the pre-existing issues that are going to kill anything that you're learning about coupling. And so we have to right the, the, the wrongs and, and heal the pain that goes back into childhood. Because if I'm living in my childhood in a survival mode, I get married, but I never leave home. And the spouse never leaves home either. And that's the way Judy and I were. I, I tried to make a, a Charlotte Higstrom out of, out of Judy, and Judy tried to make a Ben Moser out of me because her dad was safe, and, and I thought my mother was the greatest housekeeper, so it wasn't anything about intimacy. I just wanted Judy to vacuum and rake the shag carpet like, like my mother did, and my mother was meticulous in that area, but uh, she wasn't a good wife. Nobody ever taught her to be a wife, and so my mother and father had no relationship. I, I can't remember a time my dad ever hugged my mother. It just didn't happen in our home, so I was not demonstrative with Judy. She'd say, tell me you love me, and I said, I told you I love you when I married you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. And, you know, and that's not a great response. But neither of us left home. In the second marriage, both of us left the dysfunctions of the home that we, we came out of, and we worked together to build the relationship that works for us letting all the junk of the old family go away. And, and if there was good stuff, and there was some, uh, we we salvaged that. But we put together what we need for us because through the program, Judy and I, are uh, we have matured. We're not living on adrenaline. We're not triggered all the time. We're not arrested in development. And and we learn three things, and these are three things that people that are listening to us need to write down. Number one, the value of the relationship is always greater than the conflict of the moment. The okay. value of the relationship is always greater than the conflict of the moment. Number two, 
We have learned to define the problem together, and we attack the problem instead of each other. So learn to define the problem we're dealing with together, and then we attack the problem, not attacking each other. Then the third one is one that women love. And and Jimmy and I have been able to work this out, that there's no problem that can arise within our relationship that we can't resolve in 72 hours, three days. And if we'll, if we'll take three days, relax and not fight, but talk things through, we, we are, I can tell you tonight as I'm speaking to you, and I just talked to my wife about probably 45 minutes ago because I'm, I'm on the road up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and she's back in Denver, but there, there's not one thing between Judy and I that isn't resolved at this point in time. Isn't that wonderful? Everything is smooth. Everything is, has been worked out. And so we just we live day to day, and we know that we can resolve any problem that comes down the pike because we're both maturing in a way that we don't do stupid stuff or childish stuff anymore. And so when we get to that point, it, it becomes a pleasure to be married. It becomes a, an intimate thing that we can talk about anything and everything and resolve the conflicts. And and so I'm my wife has a husband and I, and I have a wife. We're not two children fighting over stuff that we don't understand. See, and that's all part of a growth. And so we we had had we stayed together this December, we would have been married 53 years. But we had we had seven years out, uh, three and a half years we were separated, and three and a half years we were divorced. But we've come back together, and the life skills skills have taught us that we can have a terrific relationship and it's not the relationship the first marriage was. The first marriage was two little kids fighting amongst themselves who had never left home and now we're we're not fighting amongst ourselves. We have developed a system that works for us and we resolve conflicts, honor each other and we have bonded emotionally and and we work together and live together and play together. Uh, in the same ministry, and and we never get tired of each other. We can talk for hours and hours, and that's what a woman likes to do. That's bonding for a woman to be able to talk about anything at any given time. And so it's just all growing up. If we grow up, things happen that are wonderful, just wonderful. So we can restart the brain, and we can grow up, and we can put together relationships, and we can make our our children safe. Even my, my kids feel really safe because they know mom and dad are committed to each other. And so all that insecurity and all the feelings that the, the mom and dad got a divorce because of me, that's all gone. And we get together and we have a great time. Fantastic. Steve, you've been quiet. What, what do you have to say? Well, I, yeah, hey, uh, Dr. Hagstrom, if you would, too, I would like you just to explain the part of the brain because, you know, we were talking, Doug and I, and Joe on the show I did with them last week about just the studies that MIT did on on magnetic fields being able to distort that part of the brain that in which we get our spirituality and our sexuality. And I asked you why, you know, in uh, the world of the occult is there so much uh, emphasis on sex? And I really want you to explain that because that will explain television. It will explain the movies. It will explain what's going on as as even television becomes more uh, uh, profane and more occult. You know, obviously vampires and everything else that's going on, zombies, yeah. etc. The bottom line is when you shared that with me, actually I saw it on one of your uh, DVDs and then I basically called you on it, I need you to explain that. That's so critical because people are are plugged into their iPods, they're plugged into their uh, uh, iPhones, they're plugged into their headsets, uh, the Bluetooth that they put literally over that area of the brain. Will you explain that area of the brain? And, and I'm not trying to take you away, but I really feel prompted that that, that turned on so many uh, uh, switches of understanding. I never got more emails from a simple statement other than that. So uh, MIT has proven it, that, that you can basically disrupt a person's spirituality and sexuality. You can control, condition, and manipulate with the right frequency to that part of the brain. So will you explain that? Yeah, I can I can talk about that, but I want to talk about where the 
where the the spiritual seat of uh, in the brain where it's at and where the sexual seat is is placed. Right, also. that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah please, I had please a, address uh, it that I had a mentor many, many years ago, uh, and his name was Eldon M. Chalmers, and he was a godly man. Uh, he would he's the one that made you prove your doctor at a major university uh, in the United States here, and he headed up that that committee for dissertations. And and uh, he had his his life's work. Uh, he's got a book out that we carry called The Broken Brain, and and his research was just phenomenal. And I had always wondered why in First Corinthians when Paul said. When I was a child, I acted, spoke, thought, and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Well, I understood that I acted like a child when I was 40 years of age. I understood I talked like a child when I was 40 years of age. I was the resident expert, so if you brought up a subject, I knew more about it than anybody in the world. But I didn't understand the thinking and the reasoning of a child. And that's where Dr. Chalmers showed me in in his research that the brain does not develop until puberty, the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And so that really made sense. But the other thing he showed me, and and he made me, uh, I was working on the the youth program that we used uh, uh, part of in, in Columbine 12, 13 years ago, and service to several thousand students with a, a, a program that we put together for that. And so I was I was uh, looking at his research, and he showed me that behind the left ear, on the left side of your brain, uh, is is a, a, a circular area about the size of a Hostess donut. And one of these where you buy ten little ones for a dollar and ninety cents at a gas station, you know, with a cup of coffee or something like that. And and that, that that place in the brain about the size of one of those little donuts is is the 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 seat of the spiritual understanding. And then inside the donut hole is the seat of a sexual drive. And and our creator put those two things together to help us understand that in a marriage in, in, in a monogamous marriage in which our creator, that, that's his way and, and his doing, he, he created it that way, that as we have this wonderful emotional attachment as a mature adult in a marriage, a monogamous marriage relationship, and the sexuality is so wonderful, and people don't know how wonderful it is because they're always looking for a high using alcohol, drugs, or whatever to find the you know, to get the best orgasm they can ever have, they don't realize that in emotional bonding with a longtime partner, that it, it makes sexuality better than anything you could do with drugs, alcohol, or whatever the case may be. And, but what happens is because of the sin nature and because, for instance, the pagans, have you ever wondered why in, in Wicca worship that it always turns sexual? Why did in in Ephesus and the Temple of Diana have temple prostitutes? Why do they have temple prostitutes even today? When you get into certain types of worship, it goes into into sexuality. It's because the the seat of the spiritual is 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 surrounding the seat of the sexual, and that's why we see situations that happen where uh, ministers when they become spiritual and they become well-known and and they have not dealt with the wounds of childhood, you'll find a minister that fails morally has generally been abused male-to-male sexually in childhood under the age of of, uh, 8, 9, 10 years of age, uh, sometimes as early as 3 and 4 years of age. And that has never been dealt with. And many times ministry-level people go into ministry because they are they they are struggling with sexual abuse in early childhood, and if they don't deal with that, if they don't get it dealt with, that's why we deal with ministry level people from around the world. We're the resource for major ministries and major denominations to restore men who have fallen 
that have been good ministers and even great ministers, but they've fallen in moral structure, and so we put that back together and deal with those core issues that should have been dealt with before they had a first date with anybody, let alone each other, you know, the, the, the husbands and wives. But that's why sexuality is so a driving force, and the more spiritual they get, the more loose they get in their in their sexual thing. They they feel like they've achieved something and that they're bulletproof and then as the as the spiritual is growing and, and supposedly maturing but it really isn't, then the sexual starts to be activated and uh, and they go down on morals charges. And so I you know, I, after after working with Doctor Chalmers for uh you know, a, a long period of time I started to see the correlation of how that many ministers become ministers because they feel they have to be a minister to be able to be be redeemed, that they're unworthy because of their their uh, pain of childhood and the, the sexual stuff that went on in their early childhood. They become ministers trying to, to use works and, and, and work, you know, do things for God because they don't feel that they're worthy of their own salvation. And we're not worthy of salvation, but Christ gives that to us as his gift because he finds us valuable. But the, the, the glitch is we need to work out those issues with someone, and, and generally not too many people understand that dynamic. But you check the, the major players. I'm old enough. I'm in my 70s, and I can remember way back in the in the late 50s and early 60s, the men that went down on morals charges, and they were all men that had had uh, abuse, uh, sexual abuse in childhood. Uh, it's just unbelievable. I could name the names uh, and, and how they went down and, and lost their ministries. And back in those days, it wasn't, it wasn't as forgiving as it is now because we have ministers going down on morals charges, and they're back in the pulpit in three weeks. But it's uh, it's a different day and age. But I remember those days, and nothing has changed. They're still struggling with these things because of how we're wired and the unresolved issues of childhood. Uh, I talked to one minister, and I said, why are you a minister? He says, because something's wrong with me, and, and I never developed any maturity, and it's the only way I can make a living because... Uh, if I were out on a regular job, I, which I tried, and I get fired every time. So they, they go into ministry because it's a way to survive. And that's wow. not the reason to go into ministry. But that is also fixable. And, and we're seeing tremendous amounts of people that have, have gone down on morals charges, and we have a restoration program that puts them back in ministry in a three-year timetable under supervision and and accountability, and it's it, it's wonderful to see men restored, but that's the reason that uh, you know that uh, that they struggle is because of of the way the the brain is wired with the the donut of spirituality and the sexuality is in the donut hole, so it's a it's a tight tied together thing. Wow. Okay. Well, so everyone has that donut or that small donut sized. Uh, uh, spiritual well, drive. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and, and within that spiritual drive is that sexual component, and, and, and yeah. they're they're interlinked. Okay, uh, all right. Um, wow. All right. Now, now, uh, well, go on, doctor. I, I don't think I would have a question that would really make sense here because I'm going in a, a number of different directions. But um, so, so go ahead. Uh, okay. The, the the thing that we do with life skills is we are able to restart the brain and bring a person who is stuck in the age of directives. Now, again, the age of directives says that if I'm stuck there, I never come to the age of accountability and become a decision maker. So I grow older chronologically, but many of my decisions are made by indecision or circumstances, or situations, or crisis. But I, I am not a decision maker. Now, let me give you an example of that. You go to Second Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, and it says, Bring down the strongholds, bring captive the imaginations, and choose to think on things that are Christ-like. Now, that requires a decision. Am I right? 
Absolutely. Okay. If I'm stuck then by the wounds of my childhood living on adrenaline and cortisol, and I've never matured to the age of a decision maker, I I have no ability to bring down those strongholds. I have no ability to to confine my imaginations and bring those down, and I have no ability to choose what I think. I'll be driving down the road and something sexual will trigger me, and I can drive 100 miles thinking something sexual, sexual, and I can't put it out of my mind because I'm not a decision maker. So what Life Skills does is go back into childhood and restart the brain. In other, in other words, instead of having a, a brain that is diagnosed as fixation frozen and we're doing behavior modification and we're trying to, we're trying to medicate so that, that uh, we can have some semblance of, of uh, adulthood uh, and, and we really have not developed a core personality, we have a pseudo personality that is, is is what I want you to see so you won't reject me. So it looks very adult, but it isn't, and I can't make decisions. We go back in and we find the source and the reason for the fixation. And what happens is the if, if you try to if you try to use medication to delete the adrenaline, which is your is your chemical that is fight flight and keeps you alive. If you try to delete that with medication, the thalamus actually has a mind of its own. And it will say, why are you trying to delete my survival system when you haven't fixed my core problem? And it's a subconscious drive. And so what okay. happens then is, is the medication that's given becomes neutral and the adrenaline increases to override the medication increase trying to address the adrenaline. And you end up worse than when you started. And I know that the medical field will argue with me on this, but I've been doing this 30 years, and I'm seeing miracles. And, 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 and again, this is God's program. I'm not this bright. But this is God's program, and it worked for me, and if it works for me, I'm passing it out, and it's working for thousands of people around the world. And, it, and everything I'm speaking is in the Word of God. And so what happens then is as we grow and mature and, and we get off the adrenaline, we find that every behavior I have that drives me out around, in other words, I'm, 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 I'm sexually addicted, I'm addicted to alcohol, drugs, I'm addicted as a, as a workaholic, all the addictions, are nothing more than mood changers because I don't have the maturity to face life as it is. So it's an escape mechanism because I am not equipped to resolve my own conflicts. When we start identifying that this behavior is tied to this wound in childhood, all of a sudden the brain makes a jump and starts wiring because it realizes I'm, I'm in a safe place, I have mentors, I'm learning new things, and, and the brain will start rewiring again, and that's what fixation is. The brain doesn't wire like it's supposed to when we're living in fixation or AED, rest of emotional development, but when we start finding out that my behaviors, my driving forces are rooted in something that happened to me when I was a child, and when they find that they're rooted there, then the brain connects the dots and starts to work. And, and, and that's where it's exciting when people that are hurting desperately find out that I'm not flawed and defective and my brain is starting to work. Now, let me give you an example of this. I'm, I'm up here in Sheboygan. About six months ago, I was in Sheboygan, and they're testing in the school systems. They're testing our program for, for teens. They brought in six young men that are in detention full-time and six of, of the toughest cases in one of the public schools. And, and we took them through a summer school. Uh, I think it was like four days a week, three hours a day. 
for for several weeks. And I I showed up unannounced in that class, and you thought I was a rock star, and <laughs> and you know because there was one boy who was 15, and at 15 he had been in 14 foster homes, oh. and and he was he was radically out of round. I mean this kid was uh, he, he was in an absolute mess. One of the one of the ones that that psychiatry would look at and see this one's never gonna work. Uh it's not gonna happen. And yet he was changing like you can't believe. He was the star of the class. And so when they graduated they they had him speak and they brought in the psychiatrists, the psychologists and the counselors and and the school board people and all that kind of stuff. And this young man, they asked him, what about this program was so different that it brought change? And and the kid said, for the first time in my life, I found out why I am the way I am. And they taught me how to quit, how to stop it. They taught me what normal was. We're working in the prison systems. And the prisoners are saying, for the first, this is the first program that ever taught me why I, I have the attitudes and why I am the way I am, and how to stop it. That's the difference. If I'm arrested in development in the age of directives, then it makes sense that I need directives to get well, don't I? Absolutely. So, okay. so this and if we do, if we make sense of their craziness, and they find out that they're not defective, and we tie the the, the pieces together for them the brain automatically processes and our recidivism rates are extremely low, extremely low, because we're meeting the need that the home didn't meet or counseling has not met, and and they're finding out. Uh, it's like in that class we had one of the young men that, that wasn't going to graduate from high school because he was so radically screwed up. Hmm. And the... And the, the uh, Oh, what do you call it? The the Board of Education had a man on it. I could give you his name. And he told this young man, if you'll go through this program, I will see that you graduate. And that young man went through the program uh, uh, about two years ago and ended up graduating and doing good, getting good grades and, and building a relationship with his father, which he had never had. And that young man came to this class that I, I attended and surprised them, and he was the the motivation for the kids because they kind of knew him, and his reputation preceded him, and here he was volunteering in the class as a kind of a co-facilitator with our teacher and and was the example of somebody that got it and turned their life around. And and it's exciting, and it's, it's so simple, but it works. See, and, and that's why I'm, I, I tell people, send me the toughest cases you have. Dig out the toughest cases and let me have them, and I'll, I'll show you change. See, so if it'll work there and it works for me, it'll work for anybody. So, so if I understand this correctly, Doctor, you are actually engaged in muscle memory retention uh, exercises for the brain. I mean, you, you know, when we practice something physical, muscle memory retention, you go yeah. through the act. You know, do, you do it again and again and again, and pretty yeah. soon, like like you know, weapons training. So it becomes your, second nature, right? So, so you're actually instead of just throwing medication at the problem, you're actually retraining the retraining the brain. Yeah, if the, I, brain if I get is, this. the the brain is actually rewiring. Uh, there's enough neurons to wire around even stroke damage. You just got to yeah. understand how to do it. Wow! Okay? And, and so we're having we're having response in that area too. And I'm not focusing on that, but we have so many spare neurons. We have over 300 uh, million neurons in the brain, and and so if 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 we have a wiring system that brings us to pornography and we choose to rewire, in, and let's, let's, let's take it to the wall, we choose to rewire to righteousness, and we stick with that righteousness within a three-year period, the brain will rewire to righteousness, and the new axon and the, and the new pathways get the electrical impulses, 
and the old pathways don't, and they actually will will uh, uh, disintegrate because they're not being used, and they'll wash out in the weight system. So my, my walk of Christ is not just an emotional, spiritual thing. It is a physiological change in the brain. Wow, okay, and, and and God created us that way. We were created that way to be able to to do this. I mean, as you yeah. said from the beginning, okay, that makes perfect sense. Steve, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm I'm listening because I'm astonished at how much I'm learning and you know, the the thing that I'm praying and and uh you know, I'm getting emails from the intercessors. We're praying that Doug people understand that there's hope and that there is an answer. You know, when the Bible talks about our minds being renewed by the Word of God, you you call it muscle memory, the retraining the brains, you know. Hey, Paul, I just came up with something. If if more of us would uh, restructure our neurons, you said 300 million, there would be less than 300 million morons in the United States. Now, not everybody's a moron, but what I'm saying is is that uh, modern, uh, how do I say, psychiatric care, and psychoanalysis and the whole drug trade is predicated on understanding the predicated and medicated on keeping people perpetually and permanently uh, in a state of flux and so I think it's it's uh, actually independency you know it it is astonishing to me Doug and you know I know what uh, Dr. Hagstrom's teaching has helped me with understanding a lot of things because a lot of people especially watching uh, children of divorce, abandoned kids, kids who grew up with no parents. We're seeing a whole culture in the United States of basically parents who abdicated their, and, and look, this isn't to lay guilt on anybody. We're seeing, on one hand, we're seeing parents that haven't grown up to be able to teach their children to grow up, and then we're seeing kids who are forced to grow up in a wrong way. And when I say grow up, they grow up physi- uh, physically but not emotionally or, you know, they can grow, you can grow up intellectually and still maintain a very, very uh, uh, locked-in area and a filter. And, and Dr. Hagstrom, explain what filters are because every single person who looks at perception, you said something to me, emotion, is, isn't this what, feelings are not facts, yet most people go on their feelings. Is that what you found in all your years of doing this? Yeah, and, and we, we live our life on perception. I want to back up a minute. Uh, I don't have my notes in front of me because I'm in Milwaukee or in Sheboygan instead of home. Uh, I'm wrong on the 300 million uh, synapse. There, it's way more than that. I think it's like something. I, I don't. I don't even have the figure, but it's in the billion. Uh, yeah, I would have, think we that. Have, we have plenty spares. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I drew a mental blank at that point in time, but I realized that was that was a wrong figure. But we have so many spare synapses that can wire around, even damage. And this is where, in working with with uh, Vietnam vets with post traumatic stress coming home from the war, that we can, with with the right understanding and knowing what happened in childhood, we can rewire a vet until they they can come back to their family after coming home from Iraq or Afghanistan or something like that, even wounded. Uh, you know, losing limbs and things like that, they still can rewire and put the family back together again. And and that's what's exciting because uh, we have the extra uh, the extra mass in the brain to be able to wire around it, but we've never figured out how to do it. So I've got to I've got to check my figures on that one uh, uh, because I was I was wrong on that. And I don't I don't remember. I drew a mental blank. So and I do know that it's just I've I've been in a week of training up here and my mind is is uh, a little well, tired I <laughs> yeah I, and 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 but most people don't know uh, paul's been doing dr hayes has been doing his seminar all day and he planned and and he's literally on a 14-hour marathon tonight i think what is really critical too doug is that people understand that uh the the amount of our troops that are killing themselves uh, a lot of kids go into the military and they go straight into the military from uh, with a hope of a better future. And one of my prayers is, is that, that whoever is a military mom, a military dad, whoever knows that their kids are raised with trauma, I can tell you this. The one, and, and look, ladies and gentlemen, I personally read that book pretty much in one sitting. 
And like I said to you, uh, you know, there, there are all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But Jesus is the one who binds up the brokenhearted. Yeah, the scripture is clear that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And when you've got the key that unlocks the entire, if you will, God-revealed mindset, chemical set, the neurobiology, the neurochemical uh, uh, things that are going on, once you know this stuff, there is the word that everyone is lacking who is traumatized, and that's hope. And also the thing I want to talk about is the whole mind control, the literal, the intelligence agencies who have basically come up with the uh, Manchurian candidates, they seek out, look out, and search out the people that they know are going to be most suitable for this, and that's why trauma-induced behavior and trauma-induced assassins with multiple personalities is so real. And, and Paul, that's something that's interesting to me because you were one of the guys that basically helped the kids at Columbine, wrote the program to, to get them through a really dark period in their lives, but yet we're now seeing, if you will, people coming out of the woodwork. And, and I think that, again, I want to make my appeal to every veteran, every, everybody who, if, if you're a veteran, and you don't ha suffer from PTSD, then please order the book and give it to people that do. Because Dr. Hagstrom has been given a remarkable revelation. This isn't psychobabble. Uh, it is not a, you know, sociological conformance theory. This is the power of God, the scripture, the, the, the creator of the universe, uh, giving his instructions how to redeem, and, and let's use that word because it's a great word, and not only redeem and rewire your entire outlook. Because quite candidly, when you're raised in trauma, you have the filter of trauma, and everything that I looked at was through the filters of trauma. And when I began to understand the filters, I could, be again to, or I could begin to take charge of certain aspects of my life I didn't like and certain aspects of my life that, uh, in my case, massive head trauma, physical trauma. And so when people used to tease me and say, you, what were you, dropped on your head as a kid? I said, no, but I was hit by a car at 60 miles an hour and thrown 100 feet and, you know, ended up on my head. So the point being is, is that what I'm learning is, is God has a unique compensating redemption. And that compensating redemption, those are my words. The bottom line is, is that with what Dr. Hegstrom's uh, been given by literally uh, the, the school of the spirit, it works, it helps people, and again, for those of you that have friends that are, are military or anybody that's suffering from PTSD or what you could call arrested development and people that are just struggling beyond anything. And this goes for husbands, and, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, and wives. And it, it, one of the things that Dr. Hagstrom, uh, uh, his, his saying that it is locked in my heart, if you're willing or if you're teachable, it can be fixed. Is that accurate, Paul? That's it. If you're teachable, it's fixable. Well, let's take a break, can we, Doug? For yes, yes, we are. We're, as a matter of fact, we're at the top of the hour. Yeah, okay. ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Saturday special edition with Dr. Hegstrom and Steve Quayle. You can find Steve Quayle at stevequayle.com. And uh, Dr. Paul Hegstrom at lifeskillsintl.org. That, that's Life Skills International or lifeskillsintl.org. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Stay with us. 